the first day we launched on iTunes, we were the number three movie on the iTunes total charts. And they hit us up and said, hey, who the crap are you guys? <laughs> like, what is this movie? How have you done this? On the 52nd episode of Passion in Progress, filmmakers, the Buttery Bros. Have you ever been scrolling through Netflix, Hulu, iTunes, or even your in-flight movies on Delta and seen a documentary on CrossFit? Well, chances are it's part of the fittest series produced by Heber Cannon and Marston Sawyers. I came across these guys when I first saw Froning, and I've been keeping track of their documentaries ever since. The way that they shoot and tell the stories of the athletes during the CrossFit Games is something truly inspirational. And not only that, the cinematography of their documentaries is super smooth and buttery, just as their name implies for the Buttery Bros. The craziest thing to me though is that they've taken their production value from their documentaries and translated it into a weekly vlog on YouTube. But you don't have to take my word for it. I think their work ethic and production value speak for themselves if you were to watch any of their documentaries or videos on YouTube. And speaking of production, if you dig what you've heard or seen on this podcast, I would love you forever if you share this episode out with a friend. You can tag me at Javier Mercedes X, that's J-A-V-I-E-R, Mercedes, just like the car, X. As always, thank you to my patrons that are supporting me through Patreon. I'm at patreon.com forward slash Javier Mercedes. With all that out of the way, I could not be more excited to present to you episode 52 of the Passion in Progress show with the Buttery Bros. What is up, Mercedes and Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion in Progress show where we talk to inspiring individuals and hopefully through hearing their stories, you too are motivated to go out and pursue your passions. And today on the show, we are celebrating one year of doing this podcast, the Passion in Progress show. And I could not be more excited to have some of the fittest people that have oh, ever fittest. been on the podcast I'll before. And hands down, taking YouTube by storm, the best vlog on YouTube 2019, the Buttery Bros, yeah, are here dude. in Austin, Texas. How is it going? Dude, it's going good, man. We've just been here hanging out the past few days at the Fittest Experience. And uh, yeah, good to have us. Yeah, thanks for having us on the show, man. God, what that, look at that energy. Yeah, man. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Let's talk about Netflix, how you guys got your films onto the platform. And do you want to give a little broad background for the audience that doesn't know uh, where you guys are coming from with your fittest series? Yeah. So I'll kind of give you a, a brushstroke history. 10 years ago, 2009 ish, I was uh, just getting out of college, had my own video production company, was doing documentary work on the side. And my goal was like, I want to go make movies in Hollywood. Uh, found CrossFit, fell in love with it in 2008 and was paying for my gym membership by making videos for the local gyms. I love how it's bleeding together already. <laughs> That's so cool. CrossFit, I reached out to them and said, hey, I'm here in Salt Lake City. I do videos for these gyms. If you guys ever need work, let me know. Within five minutes, I had an email back saying, let's have a phone call. That led to like a six hour phone interview the next day to a year later, I was moving down to Cross, CrossFit in Santa Cruz. So I was in Salt Lake City at the time. And my first, one of my first assignments was to help them figure out how to get a pilot for a TV show to then be able to get their sh sport onto ESPN. Mm -hmm. So Marston and I worked together at the time and uh, we knew each other at the time. He came down and helped me and we pre produced a pilot that covered like a live event of what the sport could look like. Three months later, we're on ESPN and I'm directing that sitting in like a TV truck. I've never done that and saying like, Camera oh, one, ready one, take he two. He was pale. Like, like, yeah, like it was a, it was a stressful six day weekend. This is the live event. This isn't stuff that's recorded and then you get to process it later. No, this is oh, live. Man. And then and then after the live event of the weekend, uh, we got into post produced shows. So like World's Strongest Man and American Ninja's Warriors, like they make it kind of feel live, but there's definitely like some post production edits to them to make the story flow better. Yeah. And I, so we did that with our shows there where we produced, I think it was like 12 shows. 12 half hour shows Jeez. that like, obviously like we'd never done that before. And like CrossFit had never done that before. And it was like a very new venture and everything like that. But it was uh, like probably one of the most growing learning processes of uh, like starting my career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and he were, did an amazing job. We'd be in the recording booth, like re voicing the, 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 the competitions as if they were live. So it was like it, you would get some pretty interesting reactions to like 
Oh, we've seen this probably like 30 times, but we're recording it as if it's happening live, you know? Yeah, like, oh, man, we need more energy because you haven't seen this 40 times. Like, <laughs> this is the first time you're seeing it, and we have to pretend it's exciting. It's yeah. not just someone lifting a weight. Mm-hmm. So we got through those, and that, that was like that was like a crash course of like how to do this. And then 2012, it was still like another thing like that. I knew very early on, I didn't want to do live TV. Like, that's not my thing. That's not my jam. I like to take time to process and tell the best story possible, not just the story that's happening. Um, and that you happen to capture. So uh, by 2013, I had pushed away from like, I don't want to do live stuff. And CrossFit was cool enough to be like, no, we want you to grow. We want you to have creative freedom. And I got a lot of creative freedom because of how successful the ESPN shows had been doing. Um, and the and the work, like they recognized the hard effort that Marcia and I had put in. And so we got to do some really cool things kind of around that area. And in 2014, they said, hey, we want to do like a YouTube feature film. We want to do like a documentary that covers the sport. Mm-hmm. I had done like a 30 minute short documentary on, on the 2013 CrossFit games and the 2014 CrossFit games. There was, there was like one story where I was like, that's the story of the year. It's this guy who's, who's won the CrossFit games from 2011, 12 and 13. So he's won it three years. He's going to come and win it for his fourth year. And he's told me in private that he's going to retire at the end of this year. Oh wow! And I was like, this guy is, this is going to happen. No one can touch this guy. It's going to be the only story that matters. And so uh, I got the green light to, to then create this movie called Froning. And it's Froning, the fittest man in history. I think it's still available on Netflix. It showed up in Hulu the other day. I don't know how that's working. Uh, CrossFit was, they said, cool, let's do it. And so I shot it and it took me about a year to edit the whole thing. And by the time I was getting close to finishing, I, their, their plan for it was always to just go straight to YouTube. Like, we're just going to dump this thing onto YouTube. And I was like, look, for me, this isn't just a YouTube video. This is an art. This is a feature film. Like we've put a lot of effort into this thing. Like let it go to a platform that is like recognized by peers of filmmaking to be a feature film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that took some back and forth where they didn't like for them, they just wanted the eyeballs on it to then kind of translate into maybe people come to the gym or building the sport. So everybody that was above me within the company had different like goals of what they thought the thing should be. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, the person above me, <clears throat> Sevan Matosian, who Matosian, who is the executive producer on the film, helped us out a little bit and pushed it through to go on iTunes and go. Uh, yeah, basically, I think we just went on iTunes initially. Mm-hmm. The first day we launched on iTunes, we were the number three movie on the iTunes total charts. And they hit us up and said, hey, who the crap are you guys? <laughs> like, what is this movie? How have you done this? And I was completely blown away by the response. Like, people loved the movie. They, they told their friends about it. They posted on social media about it. And it did extremely well. Like, I want to say the movies above it were like Jurassic World. Um, I can't remember the second one. And then it was our movie. Like, Something in 2014. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was 2015 at this point. Okay. So it was like. It was, it was pretty epic for me as like a filmmaker. I'm like, I'm seeing my movie right next to Jurassic World on this big image thing on, on iTunes. From there, the next day, Gravitas Ventures tweeted me and they said, hey, we've seen your movie. We love it. We want to represent you. We want to distribute your film. Ah. And so then from there, like we went, th- we, we j- jumped the process of like most people make a movie and then they shop it around at like film festivals till a distribution goes, oh, I want your movie. I'm going to buy it and take it and sell it for you. So we just skipped that because we put it on iTunes ourselves and then they came to us because of the success of it. So like we had a built-in audience. So because of that, they then took it and shopped it around and got it on Hulu, which then the next year led Netflix to being like, oh, well, we want that movie. So by the time we got to the 2015 movie, Fittest on Earth, the story of the 2015 games, um, Netflix was extremely interested. And from there, they've, they've picked up every movie that we've put out. That's awesome. Money follows value. Yeah. yeah. You guys put out the value. There's the money. Yep. That's the first one. And then there's three more, correct? Do you correct. want to, um, but by the way, one of my favorite things watching those was, um, sorry if I pronounce it wrong, but Sarah, um, Sigmund's daughter, Sigmund's daughter, yeah, Sarah's the mom. that the, I, which video is it where you guys are out with her working in the middle of nowhere? She's like in a parking lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. That one, that shot fitness. back to the bar. Yeah. That it's like, who are these guys that yeah. made this film? Yeah. Because the, the shots, in and of themselves, in the way that the editing flows before and after that shot, I was just like, I, I stopped the movie and rewatched that scene so oh, many yeah, times. That's it's awesome. Like, it's so that's one intense. of our favorite scenes of any of the I movies. Because it yeah. it's so good. Yeah. Can you talk about the relationship 
of what you guys do and how you get those intimate moments with the athletes themselves? Is that something built up over time? Was it like you just showed up one time and then like, hey, do you mind if I just stick a camera in your face while you're trying to sling some weights around? How does that Yeah, well, I mean, we've basically like when these athletes show up, we we, they catch our attention and we're like, who's going to be good on camera? Who's going to give us like the best content and what's going to be the best story? So uh, like with Sarah, she showed up in 2015 and we got kind of got to film with her before the games. But like at the games is when she really caught everybody's attention. And it's just kind of like. A, a relationship that we started early on that just kind of over time and over years just grows. And like we, we were just filming with her in San Diego a few weeks back and we're like really good friends with a lot of these top athletes. And that's like what we've really valued in what we've been doing is because the relationships that you build with these athletes, like they, they trust you and they know that like you're going to make them look good and we're not trying to like manipulate their story in any way. We want them to shine and we want them to help grow the sport. So mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's as people show up on the sport, like uh, I think at this point, they may know who we are as filmmakers and and who we what we do in the sport. And yeah, like they're just great humans and they're easy to work with. And we want to keep doing that. And Heber's been really close with all the top athletes, too. Like he's really good buddies with Froning and like Fraser. We've become really good friends with just in the past uh, three or four years. And yeah, it's it's great. Yeah. For those that don't know, those are all. Like the top of our sport, those names that were top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if they, the audience is CrossFit they, uh, centric. <laughs> they've been popping in and out of your guys' vlog, um, which uh-huh. is like <laughs> the the production value on your guys' vlog is so superior to a lot of what's on YouTube. And Thanks, man. I, I commend you guys for it. Tell me about the process of what goes into what you're doing, because I know. When you guys had the open, you had some sort of format like, well, at least we're going to be doing this. But from week to week, at the end of your vlogs, you're like, tell them what we're going to do next time. <laughs> and then like sometimes you're like, well, we're going to. Yeah, we don't know what we're going to do this time. So just check back in next week. Yeah. Um, how's the ride been these last three months, especially from what you were talking about, making a piece of content for uh, what people look for in a film on a Netflix, a Hulu, and those platforms, and now you're creating stuff for YouTube. Has your opinion changed of the platform? And I feel like I keep asking questions, so I'm going to stop talking and let you guys talk. Okay. So, not that anything is ever wrong with with YouTube. It was just something that we've already done. We've been there. We've made a lot of videos that have millions of views on YouTube. So, for, for the Froning film, it was like, I want it to be on a platform where people buy it and watch it on a big screen. Yes. Like, we've shot this in 4K. We've shot it with big cameras. The other side, so there's two sides of this. We're like, I want people to see this in the biggest format possible. Yeah. I also am very understanding that like probably 50% of the audience is watching it on their cell phone while they're taking a dump, you know? <laughs> so, so like, yeah. so like the production value that we, like we probably spend way more time than 90% of YouTubers because we come with the filmmaking background where I didn't feel like I could put my name on a vlog without it being like very crisp content on a regular basis and that's not to say we won't have raw and like regular content coming eventually but for our channel right now like that's kind of how we stand apart from other youtubers and crossfit youtubers is is the amount of time and brought uh production value that we put into it and then that makes it a lot easier for a sponsor to be like hey i want to invest money with you guys and have my product on your show mm-hmm. because yeah, you have like, such a consistent look yeah it's more of like we approach it as like episodes and shows than like just like another vlog because Vlogs are great, but like what we bring to the table, I think, is a little bit more storytelling as far as like uh, the the pre production and figuring out like who we're going to have in our show, who how we're going to incorporate them, how we're going to incorporate our sponsors and the different brands and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I was going to ask. So one of the things that you guys talked about was the sponsors, and I I think what's awesome about where you guys are at is you only have in the grand scheme of most YouTubers, um, when you start a channel, you have X amount of videos, but right off the bat, you have sponsorship. How did that look when you guys went to go do the idea of the Buttery Bros channel? And then when you started to implement everything, like what was the process beforehand? And has it kind of panned out what you guys thought it was going to be? Well, when we started the channel, it was like, very uh the the first the first episode that we shot wasn't even like intentional it it just kind of happened like we were in matt fraser's garage we did a workout from dubai called acid bath i went against heber and we actually had 
Matt Fraser's girlfriend film it. So <laughs> after we did it, it was just like we the we watched back the content. And we we're like, man, this is actually like entertaining and fun. And I, and I was like, we I think we could like cut this together and put it on YouTube. And that was kind of like as much as we had thought at we, that we, point. We had really? toyed with it. Like when we were in really? du- when we were in Dubai, we filmed like a little bit of back and forth, but we hadn't gotten anything to a point where I was like. We got a good show. We got something awesome. So when we got to when we got that, we were like, okay, I think we got an I think we got an idea here. Yeah, and so the the term buttery is something that we've always said whenever we like hit a really nice shot, or if it's like super smooth, that it's like, man, that is a crisp look. That's a buttery shot. Okay. (laughs) So then, like when we were in right when we were in Miami before we went to Wadapalooza, which was like the second sanctioned event of the year, that's when we put it up. And then we're walking around the event that weekend, and people are like. Hey, is that the buttery, the buttery bro? <laughs> and we're like, holy shit, people are watching our stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, we, at the beginning of the year, set out to make our fittest series. That's kind of like our big pie in the sky. Like that's our big project we're working on this year. That's going to be like six to eight episodes docu series. And between all that is when we're trying to do these vlogs because we want to be able to turn out content regularly that's fun and like that we can involve the athletes and give them a platform to still, cause there's nobody else really doing that right now as far there's a few other people. But, uh, since then it was, it was kind of like, all right, there's this, there's a pot, there's a lot of potential here. How can we sell this to a sponsor? It's like, is that even possible? How are we going to do that? And then around the open is like when we realized that CrossFit's not going to be doing the same produced open announcement shows that they were in years past. And we were like, how can we be the guys to that can go to these announcements to uh, present it in a way that's polished and that it comes out the next day. And it's basically like the best piece of content that comes out from the open announcements. And that's where the sponsors, I think, see the value. Can you give a a breakdown of what the open is just for the people that don't know? Yeah. So the open to to, to kind of give a, a, backstory on all of this uh the open in the past has been this um to get to the crossfit games which were where we crown the where crossfit crowns the fittest person on earth fittest male and female or fittest team to get there the qualification rounds used to be the open which is an online competition that is five weeks long where people do one workout a week that crossfit creates so they post a workout to to a website Four hundred thousand people last year did the workouts uh one, they post one workout a week. So like you kind of repeat the workout multiple times, you submit your scores and then the top like 50 in seven regions around the world or eight, nine regions around the world would move on to a regional level location workout or, or event. So you would go to what they had, the regionals, which was like nine of those. And then the top four from each one of those would go to the CrossFit games ending with like 40 people and 40, 40 men, 40 women going for that title. Yep. Uh, they've shifted that. They've gotten rid of all the region events. So those are those used to be owned and operated by CrossFit. They've allowed other local events um, to become sanctioned. So if you win this event that we were at in Miami, the top male and female got now have a ticket to the CrossFit Games because of their performance at that event. So they're moving into a much more broad platform where um, any event in the world could potentially become a sanctioned event and send their champion to the CrossFit Games to try and get a title of the fittest on earth. So the CrossFit Games has very much changed. And mm-hmm. part of that change is they got rid of all their media department. Mm-hmm. So those are all being kind of outsourced. So part of that was for the last seven years, for each one of these one workout of the week uh, things during the open, they have this big show where they'd bring in two of the top athletes. They'd have a giant crowd. And it was always a big reveal when, hey, okay, we were going to find out tonight thursday night at 5 p.m pacific what the workout is for the week and there's all these people tuning in because they want to see the show they want to find out what the workout is and then for four days over the weekend everyone's doing that workout Mm -hmm. so when they weren't going to do that they they uh kind of gave that show to local affiliates or events so we there was a sanctioned event the first weekend of the open in london and they were going to they had the uh, opportunity to announce to the world what 19.1 the first workout of the 2019 season was and knowing what i know about live broadcast i knew like there's no way they're going to have a great show like not anything against these guys just they don't have the time they don't have the preparation and uh the biggest factor that they don't have is a good connection to make sure like you can put together a great show but if you don't have a solid connection to the internet and it drops, everybody's going to be furious if you're trying to do it live. Mm-hmm. Like if, unless you prepackage it and put it on a YouTube thing, like no one's going to enjoy it. No, and the, everyone's going to be outraged about it. We saw that as an opportunity for us to be like, oh, well, they're not going to do something polished. 
let's do it. And so we like maxed out credit cards, went to London, created this, this vlog, and that's where it really started to take off. And immediately after we dropped the first episode, we had two or three sponsors call us and be like, hey, some of this media is lacking in this area and we used to put all our money into that. We see opportunity here with you guys and like we want to try and work with you on this. And so it opened the door pretty quick. So now that you see both sides, and since 2019 hasn't played out all the way, I, I know it could differ as the year goes. Which which way do you like better at this point? How it's decentralized or how it was before? I think it's good. It'll be interesting to see. So there's a lot of opportunity for the sanctioned events. There's a lot of opportunity for athletes. It's just a rough year. Mm-hmm. Big changes have happened. People aren't used to them. It can be really cool. I think there's potential there. Um, I think that they did it in a really like criticizing the company. I think they handled the direction in a really poor way. They could have done it a lot easier for their former employees as well as like the community in general. I don't think they took care of their people. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, let's let's talk about where it's at right now and what you guys are up to. Um, like I said, like from day to day, from week to week, how is the production? What are you guys doing on the back end that people don't see? Um, is it like you guys are taking a full week to piece together the footage that like just this weekend? What will happen when you guys go back home? Is it like you guys are <laughs> yeah, on the airplane so, and you're like, Rah! yeah, basically. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're trying to like uh, have everything that we've shot and and basically cut and produced, put it together within a day or two after we shoot it. So, so yeah, like the the thing that makes it nice is the immediacy of it all and having like this nice polished show that just happened, you know? So, uh, we've got a lot of other things coming up and like a lot of, it's kind of cool. Like people are reaching out to us from like far stretches of the world that want to just like kind of bring us out and, and show what they're doing. And we're like, yeah, we'll come to Aruba. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, like we've, we're, we're going to go to like three more sanctioned events as of right now. And, uh, between all that, we all want to do like a lot of home visits with these athletes to be able to just catch up with them, get footage that we can put in the vlog as well as in our series that we're working on. And yeah, there's just there, there's a lot of possibilities and we're, we kind of take it week to week like this last week and the week before. It's like we're, we're on the phone doing administration type stuff, trying to sell vlogs, sell and, and involve more sponsors, trying to find people that fit with what we're doing and what our brand is. And uh And then also talking to athletes, like we came here, we met with someone who was like, Hey, I have, I have this going on next week. Do you want to come film it? And we were like, that sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. And had we not known, like, had we not, had we had something planned, we might've had something not as cool planned for next week. So sort of being like, it gives a little bit of freedom and it's also a little bit of frustration because like, you joked about earlier there are times where we end our vlog and we're like we're not gonna we don't know where we're gonna be (laughs) but it's gonna be awesome so you know you're gonna want to be there and that's kind of like that's what's cool about what we have going on right now is we know what we're gonna do we're only gonna do stuff that we have that we find fun and that's sort of like one of the main driving factors is as long as we're having fun i think people enjoy what we're doing as content creators for everybody that's aspiring to be a content creator who's in the thick of things doing content myself included Advice for, you mentioned administration part, how much of what you're doing is more reaching out to people, contacting people versus what like actually filming and editing things like at this point of where you guys are at, what would you say, what would you want people to focus more on? I would say don't focus on sponsors until you know that you can sell yourself. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to go to brands and be like, Hey, like if I'm starting out and I have two subscribers, like I, yeah. I could spend eight hours a day calling sponsors and not get anything because mm-hmm. who cares? Like hone your craft, get really good at creating something and make sure that like create something that you would want to watch over and over again. Like mm-hmm. that's what I learned watching those, creating those documentaries with Marson and the people at CrossFit was like, I created something that I had to watch literally 100 times before anybody else outside that office was going to see it. And so if I was going to watch it that many times, then for sure you would enjoy it once. (laughs) There you go. What about you? Honing your craft, find what your niche is really. Um, Yeah. Like I think that we fit into a pretty good like fitness realm and that's Mm -hmm. like something that we also want to expand upon. Like we're in CrossFit right now and we have been for a long time, but we're also interested in like all different types of fitness and, and people and involving them in any way that we can. So we're trying to expand our reach as we should i think and for content creators i think that like just 
have patience too, you know, like you're not, I mean, we have, we have to keep our own patience about us, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, we're just like blowing up all the time, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, you gotta have patience with what you're making and, and figure out what your voice is and what your message is. And we're still figuring that out, out ourselves. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's just fun to create stuff at the end of the day to be like, this is what I made, you know, it's like, I have something to show for my work. And that's like why I even got into filmmaking and stuff like that, where it's like, if I was just, you know, at a desk typing or something, you know, like, I just like having something to show for my work. Yeah. In your guys' realm, what does consistency mean to you? Oh, I hear consistency and I just think nutrition right now. Cause that's like, <laughs> so, okay, like, okay. that's like the number one. <laughs> I have literally, we both have little bands on that uh, yeah, yeah. our nutrition coach gave me, which says, uh, and this is great. Consistency, not perfection. perfection. Yeah. Consistency, <laughs> not perfection. Not perfection. Yeah. And so like, uh, working against gravity. That's there. You're probably asking about like, well, no, I, do you I, do this every, I, I, do you I do just this? want to see what it means to any, anybody. I mean, consistency as far as like publishing, like that's sure. pretty, that's very important. Like when we were doing the open, we were publishing every Friday because the open announcement was every Thursday. We're a little bit off of the, consi- like we're within a week to 10 days of when we've been pr- publishing. Mm-hmm. So I think it's pretty important to be able to pick a day that you can consistently like, cause your audience will be like, Oh, every Tuesday at three o'clock, they're going to post a video. Like that's, what's important. I think is, is your audience knowing what to expect and like when you're going to be giving them more content. Yeah. It's very tough. And like, I got to tip my hat to the people that can do like daily vlogging. Cause that's just like, so like, I don't know how people do that. Like mm-hmm. we, we're trying to do a weekly show. That's a package, like almost like a half hour. That's like more like an episode than like, just like a 10 minute vlog of us. Like talking at a kitchen table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, consistency have, in that regard. To keep that entertaining every day, man, I got I got mad respect for those people. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna my, be so hard. One of my good friends, uh, Cody Warner, he did a whole year of um, daily vlogging, and he did a pretty good job. But he kept his to six minutes. But uh, he noticed as the year went on, he hit some pretty good highs with some of his videos. And the guy's really, really good at putting together videos. But as the year went on, the audience retention and everything started to, de- to degrade. And he wanted to provide value to the people that came and saw the videos. He just didn't want to put out a video to put out a video. Yeah. yeah. So he stopped doing daily vlogging since then. But I think that's, in, in my regard, if you are looking to create content, I think just setting a schedule, like you're saying, and sticking to it and just being like, all right, if it is daily, then hopefully by the time you get done by 100 days, you're going to know what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then go on from there. But yeah. One of the other questions I was going to ask is with CrossFit in general, from your guys' first film to where you're at now, where have you seen your influence and in how it's brought people to the platform? To YouTube? Not, not necessarily YouTube, but just out to do CrossFit in general. Yeah, I mean, I think... Well, with it being on like our movies are on Delta flights now and they're also yeah, on Netflix and that. stuff. What's surprising is like how many people have reached out to us that don't do CrossFit that are just like inspired by those stories and those athletes. Cause like, I think you can learn a lot about like determination, human condition, uh, goal setting and like what goes into becoming a champion and stuff like that. So it's motivating to see that for me because it's like, I, I would only expect like CrossFitters to come watch our films, but it's we've broadened our audience to anybody that's basically on Netflix now. So the platform there has helped us. And what do you think? Yeah, well, uh, the same thing, which is the, I, I felt the opposite, which is I made frowning with the intention of it not being for CrossFitters. So we have like very basic, basic explanations in there that help people understand, kind of wrap their heads around this sport. And then the 2015 documentary, we didn't think it was going to go on iTunes. Like I had just finished running. I didn't want to do another feature film. I was like, let's make a movie for CrossFitters. Mm-hmm. And with the success of Froning coming after we started the post-production of the 2015 movie. Um, so we finished Froning that had like in July of 2015, it took a few months to get it onto iTunes. And in those, that window of time, we were already into post-production on the next year's movie. And so because of the success of Froning, they were like, oh, we can't go back to YouTube with this. This has got to go on iTunes. <laughs> I love that. And I'm like, I'm like, well, wait, we've almost finished this movie and it's not made for CrossFitters. And they're like, screw it, put it out. People will like it. And, and sure enough, it was the number one movie on iTunes uh, for documentary. For me, these movies, like my favorite movie, one of my favorite movies growing up was Rocky Four. right? What's the best part of Rocky Four? 
training montage. And that's like, we make a 90 minute training montage. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah like, actually. That's, that's, <laughs> so like the route to success, <laughs> really right. long training montages Everything's with better the montage. fittest people that you can find. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they're doing the things. It's not like, there's not like a cable helping lift these weights. They're actually doing this cool stuff. And so like, for me, I would watch these training montages of Rocky four and then be like, I'm going to go hit a punching bag. I'm going to go do push ups. And so like, I saw this happen to myself as a young kid and I have I had to think like, wow, that's got to happen to just, if it happens to me, it's got to happen to other people. Mm-hmm. Let's motivate people to get to the gym and better their lives. And so that's sort of where a lot of my creative filmmaking in the CrossFit realm has been to try and get people to better their lives outside of the, the TV screen. Yeah, that is, that is what's been really cool is just people that have, if we've motivated anybody in any way to be able to like, hey, I think I should pursue fitness or I, I've, I'm motivated to get off the couch and like do something then that's really cool because if we can help people improve their lives in any ways then yeah what a great way to to do that with our films and with our media and our content you know i wish there was like i had some sound effect where it was like (laughs) zinger love it love it Uh, so i'll I'll pare it down to three more questions um and i love how you talked about the maxing out your credit cards it it puts that you guys believe in what you were doing and you went out and you you knew that from your past experience you're proven in your skill set and what you can bring to the table you did it money value is value love it um with that being said talk about your the team that you guys have with you sometimes and how how does it look when you're creating these vlogs right now and i guess when you're doing the material, sparsing it between your documentary series that you're building and the vlog at the same time, how do you split your brain into, oh man, that footage that we just shot, probably shouldn't put it in the vlog. This should be something for the documentary. Tell me about Road of the Games and documentaries in the past. Documentaries in the past, we'd get to the end of the editing process and have like so much extra content that it was like, wow, I wish that we could like you know, you're only limited, you're limited to 90 minutes and you've been shooting stuff from January till the end of August. So we did that with the first, the 2015 documentary Fittest on Earth. And then going into 2016, we're like, how can we give more of this content to our audience so that they can like, just not lose all this stuff on the cutting room floor. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's why we decided to come up with this series called Road to the Games. And that's like a, we, we did three seasons of that on YouTube. So we would be filming with these athletes for our documentary but also creating episodes that that were coming out leading up to the CrossFit Games. And then we'd almost like save certain scenes and repurpose certain things for our documentary. And that was what was uh, being able to like figure out what was more bigger picture for this particular character in the story. We would save certain things. So it's like that Sarah scene where she is thrown down in the desert. Like yeah. immediately when, we shot, when I shot that, I was like, this ain't seen the light of day until it's the trailer. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. like this is trailer Such stuff. A, yeah. Freaking like the top five things I've seen in the past like 10 years. <laughs> Thank Love you. Love that scene. <laughs> yeah. So, and so now, I mean, we kind of like decided like, let's turn the cameras around on ourselves. And like, I, I was always like, you know, behind the camera for all these years, same with Heber. And it's like, now that we're able to like shoot ourselves and like interact with the athletes and be in these spaces and like, kind of like be the, the hosts of our own show. Like whenever we're doing that, that's obviously going in the vlog. And then when we're out on the competition floor or when we're back in the hotel room with athletes, that stuff that's a little bit more intimate that we're saving for the series. Like London, London was where we've actually only had the time where we've London and Wadapalooza in Miami. It was a very clear distinction where like I'm with Patrick Vellner. He's like we shot with Patrick Vellner and Tia Claire Toomey for uh, our docuseries. Tia is briefly in our vlog. But Patrick's not, he's in it like for like five seconds, but we have a whole 45 minute to an hour long show with just those two at that same location. So mm-hmm. like we try yeah, to find a very distinct line in the sand where we're like, we'll shoot a little bit of this. And then now it's time for us to go play. Yeah. Like when we were in Miami, it worked out really well. They had like their own competition for spectators if they wanted to like sign up and do it. We're like, that would be a great thing for me to go head to head against Heber and Tommy Marquez, one of our other buddies, yep. uh, another buttery bro. Uh, in some yeah, regard. he's like a uh, so half brother. So that is something that we can like go shoot that specifically for the vlog and have that be like its own thing. And then then we're back to filming with Patrick b- before he goes out to win an event and win the win the weekend. So it's pretty like easy, I guess, in that regard to be able to separate gotcha. vlog from fittest series so mm-hmm. i also love how you guys go live and then you have the crossfitter 
uh, like do the commentary while you oh, guys dude. are going yeah. head to head. That's, can you, dude, can that, that happen by accident? Can you dude, explain that, just a little bit for the people that don't know? Dude, that was that was that so, happened all by chance. <laughs> Patrick just started doing an Instagram live but, and like. Yeah, so let me explain. So Pat, we're we're in Canada. We're doing the nineteen four, the fourth open weekend. For, so the fourth four out of five weeks of the CrossFit Games open. Fourth one there. We're there filming with Patrick Vellner. We film him go head to head with a bunch of people, and then we're about to go. So that's kind of the stage. So, so take it from there. Yeah, so we're about to go. Pat whips out an Instagram live and he films our entire workout. But like, I noticed that he had done that. And I was like, hey, do you mind like saving that before, you know? So he saves the video and he gives it to us. And I'm like watching this back and I'm like, dude, <laughs> Pat crushed it on this commentary. <laughs> like, like we need to like get this and insert it into our vlog because like part of that is like when, when we're going, there's not like any commentary or anything yeah, to like tell yeah. the story. So that like, this is like this like, I don't know, this golden nugget that we kind of discovered by accident. So like we got that, put it in the vlog. People loved it. People thought Pat did an amazing job. And then going into 19.5, we were talking to Fraser. He was going to be competing in Miami. We're like, hey, do you think you want to like do our commentary? If Maybe you like try and one up some Patrick Vellner yeah, stuff. And he was all about it. Yeah, competition in it. Yeah, You're yeah. like, hey, this guy's second place in the CrossFit Games. Don't let him beat you behind the camera too. Yeah, and yeah. he's like, oh, I got this. <laughs> yeah. Next time we go out to an open announcement, whoever is competing, we're going to be like, hey, if, if you're comfortable with it, will you take a commentary of us going and we'll include you into the vlog? Tia also did it just by happenstance when, when we were working out with her in Miami where she was like, I'll film. And she grabbed our camera, was walking around filming it and yeah, doing you guys basically put a little bit of it into <laughs> Yeah. So just a little bit. Um, what I love is that it's cross platform and now it's like both on IG and YouTube. Yeah. And you're just like melding all of the social media together. Yeah. yeah. Crushing it. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, two questions I ask everybody at the end of the podcast. First one is, why do you do what you do? Uh, for me, it's about building a life that I love. Like I love traveling. I love meeting people. I love fitness. I love being healthy. Um, and I love movies like, and I, you know, and I love my family. So like I get to go home and be with my family now. And then I also get to go do all these really fun things that blend together into this kind of really cool show that Mars and I get to produce. So for me right now, it's just about finding joy and finding things that like, like I said earlier, like if I'm having fun and I'm in, I'm experiencing pure joy in my life i think joy attracts audience and if you see someone that's like man that's a light i want to have that i want to watch like i want to smile i want to have fun and i can kind of virtually do that through this show that these guys are producing like for me that's the best compliment when someone kind of experiences that as a viewer of our youtube channel yeah like i got into this just because i enjoyed filming the world around me and like kind of like sharing what i was up to and what my friends were doing like in high school i made all these like crazy like wacky videos and stuff and that's kind of like led to storytelling and filmmaking and doing what we're doing now and like I said earlier it's just like I like to have something that I can show like my work you know I think it's kind of cool to be able to sit back and show somebody the experience that I either I had or one that I witnessed or something that I was a part of that could either lead to some sort of emotional connection or some sort of uh, shift in thinking or just laughter or fun, you know, like that's where I'm at. And I'm like, I'm a really, like, I really enjoy laughing, having fun, telling jokes. And that's just kind of like with this vlog, it's kind of, kind of cool to be able to, to just be myself and, and yeah, just have a good time, you know? Love it. Especially with both of them, you, you are encapsulating what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> it's just like, it's, it exudes from you. Thanks. Um, Second question I always ask at the end of the podcast is from the point in, I think in one of the vlogs, you talked about slinging shrimp from a truck or something like that. <laughs> selling shrimp out of a van. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Selling shrimp out of a van or um, before you even hit up CrossFit HQ. From that point to where you're at now, whether it be a content creator, somebody in fitness, obviously you guys just talked about how happy you guys are in doing what you're doing. What advice would you give to people to get to the point where you're at right now? Oh, I don't know. Work. Yeah, Grind, like, man. Yeah, just like if if you're into filmmaking or or editing, it's just going to take reps. Like I knew. <laughs> you can... Yeah, reps. Yeah. yeah. Getting some reps. Like I, I always knew that like I always had an interest from a real early age. Like cameras are just like were something that I was interested in and like figuring out how they worked and figuring out the best way to like. Like I remember in like ninth grade, I took a journalism class and that was the first introduction to video editing with like iMovie and it was like blew my mind that you can manipulate clips in such a way and I was just like this is what I want to do and it was just like that it was like this light bulb that went off 
So, you know, everybody that starts out, starts out, you know, just learning kind of their style and technique and what, what the, their uh, look is and how they tell their own story. So you just got to like grind on it, pick up a camera, figure out what you want your niche to be and what you want to like go out and try and pursue as far as subject matter and stuff like that. What about you? Uh, I think the, the to get to where we are took a lot of rep. And I don't even like we say where we are, like we're like super successful. Like we're not <laughs> like we're what? starting out like we have a lot of success, but we're not near where we want to be. And we have a long way to go. Uh, so like to get to where we are took for me, it was a lot of reps and a lot of like a lot of work. Like I've spent a lot of nights where I lit it, like even before we did the for the open, we keep talking about that five week stretch. We would film all day Thursday, stay up literally all night to edit the video, to have it up as soon as possible. So like we in London, we worked out at two in the morning is when the show went live. So we did the workout then went back to our hotel room and edited until noon and then published the video. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's not the first time I had done that. I've done that for years. You know, when I was in high school, I was doing this. When I was in junior high, I was making videos. And I've always like found something that I was super passionate about. And then I couldn't sleep until it was complete. And so like, that's a lot of work. And I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it. So find something that you love and you want to do and you can put up with like it drive. It, it makes you so excited about it that you have to finish it and you wouldn't be satisfied if it wasn't good. So like that would be my advice. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Where can people find you? Uh, they can find us both at the on Instagram as at the buttery bro or at buttery bros. And then I'm at Heber Cannon. At Mars Media is my Instagram. And then with a Z with a Z M A R Z M E D I A. And then also just on YouTube, our buttery bros channel. Yeah. All I would say is if you have a free evening and if you don't, you should still just sit down, <laughs> put it on the TV and just watch any. Uh, th that's the thing I love about your channel. You you put on any of the videos and it's worth your time. That's you. that's like, thanks. Man. That's really hard to do on YouTube. Yeah. Um, so th thank you so much for your time. Um, if you would like to share out this podcast, you can tag me at Javier Mercedes X. That's J-A-V-I-E-R Mercedes X. And if you liked it, you could leave me a review on iTunes. Till next episode, live a life of abundance. And I'll see you guys next time. This concludes episode 52 of the Passion and Progress show with Heber Cannon and Marston Sawyers, the Buttery Bros. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, please consider subscribing to the podcast on iTunes.